they follow him for life. Once they imp it's called imprinting. Once they imprinted it on him, never changes. Can't change it. It's imprinted. And here, here he is swimming with these, you know, ducks. I think he's the mother duck, like that. Okay. So, but we know, you know, this, this is a critical period, and it really is very sharp in these in these ducklings. But but now we use the term optimal period because we know that certain things uh, are learned at different times, and there are multiple optimal periods depending for different kind of learning. So, for example, let me see if I language. You know who this is? This is Henry Kissinger and the the Brian the the uh, the Brian. No, the the, the how do you speak? The, the Russian ambassador. The Brin. The yeah. And let me see. So, so let me see if I have a, a recording of this. So Kissinger and his brother came to the United States from Germany, and his brother is three years younger than him, has absolutely no accent at all. But Kissinger came when he was nine or ten, and you know the way he talks, but I'll play it for you anyway. Let me see this here. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was uh, I was um, teaching a class to, to many pre-med students who were uh, about to graduate called Developmental Neurobiology, and I was trying to make this point about you know for language there are these sensitive periods and so on. And I said, let me play you this uh, recording of Henry Kissinger. And they, I thought, so I played this recording and they're looking at me. I said, how many of you know who Henry Kissinger is? Fifty kids in the class, one raises the hand. Wow. Still alive, just met with Trump recently. They don't even know who he is anymore. That just shows you, you know, you think your power is forever. Next generation, you know, wasn't alive when that tape was taken. They don't know who you are anymore. So just remember, you know, being famous is speeding. Okay, uh, so, and, and, and by the way, in spite of what we know about optimal periods, in America, our language is not taught until high school. You know, just the opposite of what to say. You should be teaching it from kindergarten on. There are some exceptions like this, Spanish emergencies and so on. Next thing is something that I think is really important but is not um, taken into consideration in the educational system. Individual differences do matter. Anybody who has had children, more than one child, knows that each child is individual. Uh, they learn different things at different rates. Some things they learn very well, some they don't, and the educational system, at least in America, treats everybody the same, you know, and so on. So here's a cute slide showing my individual differences, okay? Uh, that is Willie Shoemaker, who's a horse jockey, uh, one most successful in history, and that's uh, Will Chamberlain, the, uh, the basketball player, see? So they're two human beings, two men, but very different in, in the size and in other ways and what they could do. And and to appreciate this, I'm going to show you this. This is a post-mortem uh, human brain. And you look at this, right? And what you, what you see here are these kind of grooves like this, see here. Uh, and those are, are called uh, sulci. And then you see these things above it over here. Those are called gyri. So this is the left brain and the right brain. Front is there, back is there. Now, if you just look at this a little bit, same brain. The two sides of the brain are not anything like identical. I mean, for example, 
Well, let's, uh, let's just pick something here. Look at this area here. See that? It goes all the way like that. This gyrus. Here, it's like that. Yeah. Any, any other things in here like, uh, that you can see? Uh, this area here is similar to that, but uh, an area back here is very different. Here it's like this, like so. What people don't appreciate is that our brains are as different as our faces. If you could expose the brain to every person here, they would be more different than our faces. So when a neurosurgeon has to identify an area of the brain, he or she cannot look at this and say, okay, here's this sensory area, dealing with skin. Here's the motor area, here's the language. They can't do it because the, because the surface morphology, just surface morphology, is so different from individual to individual. So what has been developed, and is still used, was developed many, many years ago, a technique by a Canadian neurosurgeon called Wilford Penfield, is in the operating room, when they want to remove a tumor that's on the surface of the brain, one of the things they're very careful about is where's the language area? Because if you remove the tumor and infringe the language area, you have what's called aphasia, a language disorder that could be could be for life, could be. So what Penfield determined is this: the opening of the skull over the area where the tumor is is done under general anesthesia, and then the the local anesthesia is infused in the cut wounds. The patient is taken off the anesthetic, wide awake, and what, what he would do then is hold the probe, an electrode, and deliver a brief electrical stimulus to an area around the tumor. And the reason he did that is he wants to know what kind of function does that evoke. So if he's stimulating a light, an area that deals with vision, the person will see a little visual flash. If he's stimulating an area dealing with audition, the person will hear a sound like that. And, and, there, and what he would do is then take a little sterile piece and put that right in the brain and have number one. And somebody would write one, does this and that. Stimulate over here, two, and so on. What's interesting is you can evoke a visual sensation, you can evoke a um, auditory sensation, you can evoke tingling of the skin, if anyone is stimulated, you can evoke movement, but you don't evoke spontaneous speech. So when the brain is stimulated, nobody says, hello. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So how do you know what the, audit or, or, or what the language area is? Well, what he did was, has the patient come count backwards, for example, 100, 99, 98, 97, and when he stimulates his, the language area, there's a, a phasic arrest. The person goes, 96, that's a language area. Okay. And nobody really knows what that is, but you don't get like, no, nobody's all of a sudden starts singing something or something like that. That doesn't happen. So the reason they do this, and the Penfield thing is still used today, the reason they do it is because the brains are so different from person to person. Just the gross topography, forget about the details. Just the gross topography, more different than the faces in this room. So, stands to reason that the functions should be different, and so that you should use you know, specialized methods to cater to the particular proclivity of an individual when you're trying to, uh, you know, to, to educate him or her, or to train them in something. This is interesting, this is from a friend of mine, and, works in vision system, uh, visual system, uh, David uh, Williams. So he has a method of taking the, uh, the human eye and, and, and imaging the three different rods. The rods are, I'm sorry, th three different cones. Those are the ones that are, are um, um, processing visual information, green, red, or blue, okay? And so here is two retinas of identical twins. The same exact area of the retina, same exact area. And what you do is when you see this, you can just see how different it is. This twin has a lot more green than this twin. Okay? The pattern is just very different. You know, it'd be like like uh, like other aspects of the thing. So even something at the periphery, like how the photoreceptors are organized, is very different from one individual to the even though they're genetically identical. Okay, so the visual differences do matter, and, and, and the challenge is how to figure out uh, the learning paradigms that suit the individual best. And, and uh, I have two more to show you. So the next one is 
uh, try employing multimodal stimuli or introducing new materials. So most cells in the brain were thought, uh, when they are sensory cells, were thought to respond to vision or addition or skin sensation or smell or something like that. Today it is known that the majority of cells in the brain, specific areas of the brain, respond to multimodal, more than one sensation. And my best friend, a guy called Barry Stein at Wake Forest University, uh, did a lot of work in this area. So try to organize tasks so there's convergence of sensory input. And let me share an example from work he's done. So this is a recording from one neuron, one neuron in the brain, where it is not important. And it presents a visual stimulus to this neuron, and the neuron fires, bam, bam, two action potentials, two action potentials. Stimulus comes on and Same neuron, he presents an auditory stimulus. And, pss, like that. Here's one action potential. Now, he, same cell, he, he presents both the visual stimulus and the auditory stimulus. Look at that enhancement of responses. Many, many neurons show this kind of convergence thing. If you're using multimodal stimulation, that is not just visual, not just auditory, but both, you get a much better response, more attentive organism, and so on. And so it, 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 sometimes it makes sense, you know, when you're reading, when you're first officially learning to read, read out loud, so you see the thing visually, you know, and you hear it as well. And there are many other kinds of tasks that use multimodal stuff. And then the last one I want to show you is that it's important to present information in a context that makes sense to the learner. This is also going to be a movie. I don't know if it's going to be, be uh, what to work. So, so this is something, you know, um, uh, in that Kasparov book I mentioned, uh, he states in the early chapter that there are more people that play chess at a very high level in Armenia than any other place in the world. So I thought this is a good example. This is from a, uh, I mean, for chess players, it's going to be trivial, you know, uh, what this shows. But this is done by a study at MIT in cognitive neuroscience. And what it shows is how context is really important to performance. So this is a guy who's a, uh, I think he's about 1900 on a, on a scale, of, which I guess is that, that's pretty good, right? Yeah? Okay, huh? A rating 1900, and he, uh, what? Depending on which scale. Oh, okay. Uh, Kasparov, Kasparov had the highest in history, it was 28-something. So, yeah, I, think, I think around 2000 is, is, is just...